Chris Hedges is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who over the past decade and a half has made his name as a columnist, activist, and author. He's been a vociferous public critic of presidents on both sides of the American political spectrum, and his latest book, America, The Farewell Tour, is nothing short of a full-throated throttling of the political, social, and cultural state of his country. And with that, we welcome Chris Hedges back to TVO. It's so nice to see you in that chair. Thank you. You know, I sort of jokingly said to you in the green room before we started, having read your book, I don't know whether to kill myself today or wait till tomorrow. Right, but I said you're Canadian, so, so we don't imagine have... being an American. <laughs> this is the most depressing look at your country I think I've ever read. And if I can just be permitted sort of an observation on the top, and then you tell me if I'm totally out to lunch here. After reading this, I thought Chris Hedges sees the same problems in America that I heard from Donald Trump at the Republican convention where he described widespread carnage and mass unemployment and drug problems and so many things bad with America. Your prescriptions, obviously, for fixing all of that are different. But do you two, do you two essentially see the country the same way in that regard? No, because he, you know, it's important that he, while he will run down some of the uh, pathologies that have gripped huge sections of the country, he blames them on undocumented workers, on liberals, on Muslims, on Mexicans, you know. So he's a classic con artist or a demagogue. But you do raise an important point. He tapped into uh, the deep despair and rage uh, that large segments, in particular the white working class, feels at having been betrayed by both of the major parties. Well, let's get into it then. You call this a farewell tour. A farewell to what? a farewell to the American empire, to America as we know it. And is that a good thing? Because I've heard some people say, you know, the, a farewell to American empire will be a good thing for this world. It depends how the empire dissolves. It depends uh, what our reaction is. Um, it, it, yeah, I mean, empire, when it contracts, uh, and it will contract very quickly once the dollar is no longer the world's reserve currency um, can express itself in some very frightening forms. So, for instance, the British Empire, in essence, it was a slow collapse from the end of World War I, culminating with the Suez Crisis. Uh, in 56. The, right, the abortive attempt to retake the Suez Canal after it was nationalized. They had to retreat in humiliation, largely because of Eisenhower's opposition. And then the pound sterling was dropped. As the, and so they fell into a, a pretty significant depression. Uh, but they handled it in a different way. What happens in the United States, we're, we're not prepared at all. Uh, our democratic, social, and cultural institutions are deeply decayed. Uh, we are also a very violent society in a way that, for instance, Canada is not, or the, in the way that Great Britain is not. Uh, we are awash in weapons, and not just weapons, but these are, in essence, these AK-14, and not AK, the AR-14s that are used in these mass shootings in schools and uh, concert venues and uh, malls and movies, are assault weapons. They're not, they're not for hunting, and they're easily accessible. So um, I worry that uh, the disintegration of empire will exacerbate the kinds of dark pathologies that I spend a lot of time in the book writing about. The UK farewell tour, as you've described, it took about 40 years. How long has yeah. the American farewell tour been going for? Uh, well, there's been a steady decline, I would say, since the early 70s, when we shifted, in the words of the Harvard historian Charles Mayer, from an empire of production to an empire of consumption. So we began to borrow to maintain both an empire and a lifestyle we could no longer afford. Those began the distortions, accelerated uh, under Reagan, uh, the cannibalizing, that's when the cannibalizing of the federal government began uh, on behalf of corporations at the expense of the citizenry. You know, the famous phrase, government is not the solution, government is the problem. Well, that's true if you're Goldman Sachs or ExxonMobil, uh, but it's not true if you're a single mother trying to raise uh, children on a substandard wage or no wage. Uh, so all of the mechanisms uh, by which uh, democracy was supported 
uh, by which uh, opportunity was offered to the we, we have been slowly erased. And, and of course, we've been deindustrialized, uh, as has large parts of Canada, mm -hmm. with all of the attendant consequences that come from collapsed communities, uh, the loss of good paying, unionized jobs. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second here, because, of course, Donald Trump would say the growth rate that America is experiencing right now, the economic growth rate, hasn't been this high in decades. The unemployment rate hasn't been this low in decades. He sees other signs of a country that is economically quite dynamic right now. Well, it's all about measurement. So, uh, yes, it's true the stock market is on a run. Uh, but why? Uh, well, largely, first of all, because of the Donald, Donald Trump's tax cuts, uh, which will remove an estimated $1.5 trillion from the U.S. budget over a 10-year period. Uh, that money has not been used to uh, bolster manufacturing or create jobs. Uh, it's either been hoarded or it's been used to buy back stock, and that has inflated the stock market because uh, the senior managers and CEOs of large corporations, their compensation packages are tied to the value of stock. Presumably some of it's gone to creating new jobs. I mean, Not that's much. How, that's how unemployment gets below 4%. Yeah, Presumably. but the unemployment figures are completely fixed. If you, if you look at how they measure unemployment. So, for instance, if you work one hour a week, you're counted as employed. Hmm. Uh, the average worker at Walmart works 28 hours a week, which puts them below the poverty line. They're counted as employed. Um, if you have stopped looking for work after four weeks, you are magically erased from the unemployment rolls. And it doesn't count large sectors of the population, students, uh, retired people, who are uh, many of whom are now riding around in RV vans, uh, work, doing temp work for Amazon at Christmas for 12 hours a day in warehouses, uh, prisoners. Um, so real unemployment, the LA Times a couple years ago said, you know, real unemployment is pushing probably 17%. If, if, we're if we're talking and we're, if we removed people or if we look at people who are considered the working poor, i.e. those people who have jobs but are the, below the poverty line, uh, as in essence unemployed or certainly not receiving an income that can sustain in any way a, a, a lifestyle, yeah. I know you're not a massive fan of heartless capitalism, as I just read in 308 pages of the book. However, comma, private companies create most of the jobs that most Americans have. So what do we do about that? Well, I would argue that there are different types of capitalism. So I grew up in a farm town in upstate New York, uh, and uh, I saw the penny capitalism of farmers. Farmers produced, brought their produce in for sale. You had regional capitalism, so a local factory owner uh, who lived in the community, sat on the school board, paid taxes, and then you have corporate capitalism, which is another animal altogether. So when you talk about producing jobs, let's look at Apple. Where are the manufacturing jobs for Apple? Overseas. They're in China. Yeah. And what are the working conditions for the people who, their subcontractors, who make Apple products? Not great. It's kind of slave labor. It's huge suicide rates, wage theft. Uh, when they don't make quotas, they're not paid. Uh, people climbing up on the living in these horrific dormitories. Uh, so. Uh, corporate capitalism is an enemy of penny and regional capitalism. Uh, and it is global. It's supranational. It has no loyalty to the nation state. Uh, and it is corporate capitalism that has distorted uh, and, and kind of hollowed the American economy out from the inside. When I read your book, I see an America at war with itself between white supremacists and neo-Nazis who are trying to make their claim for the end of the world. I see you describe widespread sexual abuse in a hardcore poor industry that is completely frightening. Uh, opioid and drug abuse and heroin abuse that is off the charts. Addictive gambling run amok. Widespread, as you've described already here tonight, uh, inadequate employment and underemployment and unemployment. Far too much general suffering. I understand you're trying to tell a story here, but is that genuinely, truly reflective of America today? Yes, and, and I think that what, and I, you know, I traveled all over the country, as you know, for this, and spent two years. So I was in Anderson, Indiana, where all the old GM plants were, Utah. Uh, I, I wrote my gambling chapter out of the Trump Taj Mahal before Trump ever even announced he was running for president. Uh, 
It's in Atlantic City. In Atlantic City. It's now closed. It was, it, when I was writing, it was in deep decay. I mean, most of the rooms were mothballed. Rats. There was mice all, yes. yeah. I mean, it was, um, it was the mice were fighting on the floor and that kind of stuff. People shooting up in the elevators. So um, uh, I, I think what was so disturbing for me writing the book was how many people have been affected, especially in the opioid crisis. Uh, I don't think the numbers begin to reflect uh, the numbers of people who are addicted to powerful narcotics, depressants. Um, and uh, I mean, I list statistically, uh, the, the, we're talking about big, big numbers, big, large sectors of the American populace that in essence has found ways to check out. Uh, the proliferation of hate groups uh, is, I, I, I used for the book Emile Durkheim's great study of suicide, um, where he went back and, and tried to look, the sociologist, at what were the factors or causes that led people to kill themselves. And he talks where he coins this term anomie. Um, and I think that, that that's what I'm trying to do, is explain that anomie that has gripped, I would argue, at least half the country, and the, the dark pathologies that that anomie produces. And that fundamentally, if we don't address that alienation, that dislocation, and that despair, if we don't reintegrate these people economically, politically, and socially back into a system that no longer responds in any way to their rights and their grievances, then these pathologies will only grow. And we spoke earlier about the decline of American empire. As the pressure becomes worse, as the economic situation deteriorates, if these conditions go unaddressed, then these pathologies will explode. And I covered the war in the former Yugoslavia. And so I know what disintegrating societies that resort to violence can look like. Um, I watched as after the economic collapse of Yugoslavia in the late 1980s from a failed self-identified liberal elite that couldn't respond. Uh, I watched these figure, these distor political distortions uh, like Radovan Karadzic and Franjo Tuzman and Slobodan Milosevic essentially be vomited up out of the decay in the way that Trump has been vomited up out of a very diseased country. Well, that was what I was going to ask you. Is, is, is How much of what you're describing here is a feature of the person who happens to sit in the Oval Office today versus if anybody else were in that chair? I think Trump is the symptom, not the disease. Uh, he's a con artist, he's a demagogue, um, and uh, he, he, he was astute enough to tap into the zeitgeist. Uh, the tragedy for me, you know, there were insurgencies in both of the major political parties, mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders and the Democrat, and the Democratic Party establishment was just more astute in terms of blocking the nomination to Sanders, and I would argue that they effectively blocked it. Uh, the Republican Party establishment was not able to block Trump. And if Sanders had gotten the nomination, I think he would have beaten Trump. Um, how would America be different if that had happened? Not terribly, because uh, with a Republican-controlled Congress, it would have been paralysis. Uh, but you wouldn't have Sanders pushing forth uh, the kinds of agendas nor making the kinds of appointments to the EPA, to education, Supreme Court, Supreme Court that, uh, uh, that Trump has made. Um, and and that, that, for me, is, is quite uh, frightening. Um, and, and I think we, we have to pin some of the blame on the Clinton campaign. When you go back and read the Podesta emails, they pushed Trump as a candidate mm -hmm. because they thought he would be the easiest candidate to defeat. So both Sanders and Trump uh, responded in to, to the, the reality of the grotesque social inequality in the United States, which is greater than the Gilded Age, greater than it was a century ago. Um, the difference being that, of course, uh, Trump is, uh, is dishonest. I mean, Trump uh, is is only fueled the kleptocracy. Well, let me pick up on that, because, and you mentioned a bunch of important institutions in American society in the midst of that answer, and I want to pull a quote from the book here that deals with that. Sheldon, if you would, bring this graphic up. The most ominous danger we face comes from the marginalization and destruction of institutions, including 
the courts, academia, legislative bodies, cultural organizations, and the press that once ensured that civil discourse was rooted in reality and fact, helped us distinguish lies from truth and facilitated justice. I saw a poll recently, I bet you saw it too, in which Republicans were surveyed and 93% said, if Donald Trump says it, I believe it. Yeah. I think the same poll showed those same people saying, if someone in my family says it, only 63% of people believed it. <laughs> they believe the president more than they believe their own family. 80% of Republicans think that what's in the Wall Street Journal is not credible. 80% of Republicans don't believe the Wall Street Journal even. In that America, what hope do empirically provable facts have? Well, you pinpointed something that's very ominous. When national and political discourse is no longer rooted in verifiable fact, then uh, facts are interchangeable with opinions. Uh, truth is whatever you want it to be. And I write in the book about the nature of the permanent lie, that, that all politicians lie, all governments lie, as I have Stone said. But they lie for expediency. So for instance, Bill Clinton argues that by passing NAFTA, it, there will be many more American job, good jobs. Bill Clinton doesn't make that argument anymore because it's false and who knows whether he knew or didn't know, but it's false. With a permanent lie, reality, facts, doesn't matter. So uh, Trump uh, wins by a landslide. Trump has the largest uh, inauguration crowd in the history of, you know, it's first, first guy to win Wisconsin in 50 years. It's endless, endless. Not true. Right. It's yeah. endless, <laughs> endlessly, but it doesn't have it doesn't matter. And then you have media platforms that like Fox News that will propagate or disseminate these lies uncritically. And um, and that has corroded discourse in the United States. The, all, the, ins the, the institutions, in a functioning democracy, you have institutions, and you cited them, the courts, academia, the press, that their job is to make sure that people speak about a verifiable reality. Those institutions have become corrupted, weakened, destroyed or replaced with systems mask, you know, Fox, Breitbart, all of these right-wing uh, propaganda outlets masquerading as news. Um, the court system has been taken over and is, is now being finished off with appointments by the, from the Federalist Society, which is this ideological right-wing. So, um, and, and that, it, it creates a kind of schizophrenia where you, whatever, you know, you may see reality in front of you, but reality is denied by the power elites and by the organs, the, the media platforms that disseminate the opinions of the power elites. Uh, and that, that really begins to uh, sound like descriptions of totalitarianism someone like Hannah Arendt would write about. Hmm. I don't want to let the clock get too far away from us here without being without giving you an opportunity to speak to what you see as the prescription for getting America out of this farewell tour. And here's just a few of the ideas that you advance in the book. A $15 minimum wage, a ban on for-profit health care, a dismantling of nuclear weapons, ending trade agreements, giving citizenship to undocumented workers. What do you think implementing that menu of policies would change? I think that it, it's about reintegration. So it's about taking this dispossessed, huge dispossessed segment of the American population and reintegrating them into the country. Uh, and of course the opposite is happening through programs of austerity, uh, slashing welfare. You know, the original welfare program, which was cut by Clinton, 70% of the recipients were children. I mean, it, it's, it was called uh, AFDC. Yeah. The C standing for children. Yeah, yeah. well, and the children were sold out. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's been now a further slashing of uh, availability of food stamps. So you're, you're taking a, a, a population in distress and you are exacerbating that distress. So I wrote a book about the Christian right called American Fascists. Mm -hmm. And I came to the conclusion after two years of writing that book that the only way to battle the Christian right, which I see as a kind of Christianized fascist force, and I speak as a seminary graduate, 
Um, we should point that out. You're a reverend yes, in the Presbyterian I I, I Church. I am, yeah. You are the Dr. That's right. Reverend. That's right. <laughs> so Christopher Lynn Hedges. The, the importance, I believe, to countering the magical thinking of the Christian right was rooted in the economy, in reintegrating them into the economy, giving them the kinds of jobs, the unionized jobs uh, that were once available, where uh, you had job security, uh, job safety, a pension plan, medical benefits, and a salary that could sustain a family. That's all gone. And by making it worse, we are uh, pushing larger and larger parts of the population into the embrace of demagogues, hate groups, or seeing them uh, engage in behaviors that are willfully self-destructive. Uh, I mean, suicide, for instance, the highest rate of suicide in the United States are middle-aged white men who r realize that there's no place for them anymore. Yeah. And, as, and I quote Pope, Pope John Paul in his encyclical on work, work is not just about the exchange of labor for wages. It is about status, dignity, self-respect, uh, the ability to find a a, a meaningful place in society, uh, and we're, we're not doing it. And um, the longer we don't do it, the worse it's going to get. Here's another quote from the book. Politics is a game of fear. Those who do not have the ability to frighten power elites do not succeed. The platitudes about justice, equality, and democracy are just that. Only when ruling elites become worried about survival do they react. Appealing to the better nature of the powerful is useless. They don't have one. I guess I need to ask you whether you are actually advocating the violent overthrow of the United States government. No, I'm strongly opposed to violence as a Okay, mechanism. let's take the violent out of that sentence. Are you advocating the overthrow of the United States I'm government? I'm advocating the overthrow of a corporate government. Uh, I'm advocating the reversal of the corporate coup d'etat in slow motion. How does that happen? It happens the same way it happened in Eastern Europe. I covered the revolutions in East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Romania. It happens when people have enough. And, but how, uh, how is it not? I mean, if the Great Recession, 2008 till whenever, if that didn't, and all of the corporate kleptocracy that Wall Street got away with there, and how Main Street had to pay for it, if that didn't propel people to rise up, what will? The next crash. Uh, we're getting one. I don't know when, but it's coming. And this time around, the elites don't have a plan B. So what's they, it can't, look like? they can't lower interest rates any more than they've right. already lowered them. We're already at virtually zero. So what does that look like, that rising up that you see coming? Well, we've seen glimpses of it. Um, you know, the uh, Podemos movement in Spain, where they surrounded the parliament. I mean, large numbers of people taking to the streets, obstructing the system. Uh, I saw it in Venceslas Square in Prague, 500,000 checks. I saw it in East Germany, in Leipzig. And that was the most efficient security and surveillance state in human history until our own. Um, okay, but I'm gonna take a quote, if I remember it correctly, from your book, which was, now that we've got all those communists out of Eastern Europe, we can go back to the former government we used to have, fascism. Is right. that what's coming? Well, I, I, uh, America's already a failed democracy. Um, and Trump has no ideology. It's an ideological vacuum, which is very rapidly being filled by the Christian right. And we saw it. He just had a big White House dinner with evangelicals. He has 81% uh, support among evangelicals. Um, I, I, that, that the, and as Noam Chomsky says, you may want Trump out, but believe me, Mike Pen Michael Pence will be worse. Uh, the Christian right is organized. They have their own universities. They have their own... Uh, media platforms and systems of indoctrination. Um, they have huge uh, amounts of money behind them, including the most retrograde capitalists in the United States. So is that what's coming to replace whatever this is? I, I, I'm a reporter, and I, and, I, and I learned a long time ago that you know, trying Don't to predict. predict the future mm -hmm. is a very dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, unless there is uh, sustained mass civil disobedience to put pressure on... Uh, two political parties and a system uh, that is completely captured by corporate power, 
then what's coming, I can, the, I can assure you, will not, not look nice and not be good. You've called this uh, America the farewell tour, but I wonder if this is exclusively, in your view, an American story. No. Uh, and we know from, you know, what's happening in Europe, uh, Brexit, uh, Hungary, Poland, which are kind of quasi-fascist states now. Uh, Canada is not immune to this. You, you also, not to the extent that we have, but you've had your experiences with mass shootings, um, populist politics, populist politics, but it's far more virulent and pronounced within the United States because empires are always fragile uh, in this sense that they depend on the control of uh, foreign labor, foreign resources. We have 17 years of warfare now in the Middle East, feudal, endless. Uh, you know, meanwhile, our infrastructure is collapsing, crumbling. Public libraries are closing, schools are, uh, teachers have to buy basic supplies for students. Uh, and, you know, now we have this insane idea that we're going to uh, train teachers in public schools to carry concealed weapons. I mean, it, these are all examples of a society that is completely unmoored. Uh, so uh, it, it, it is not it, hardly unique to the United States. And, and it will have a ripple effect in countries like Canada, uh, but it will never reach the extent of um, chaos and potential violence. Because, but, but never forget that, that within American society, we are a deeply violent culture, awash in weapons. We believe in the regeneration through violence, this myth that violence is a form of purification, um, and that comes out of our long history of genocide and slavery. Uh, you started with a revolution. Yeah. We did not. You yeah. did. Well, we also killed 90% of the indigenous peoples mm -hmm. in the United States uh, and enslaved 4 million Africans. Uh, and, uh, and we've never really confronted that, uh, you know, that dark aspect in, a, in, in American history. We, we cling to our national myth. Uh, and, and so that does make us different and more dangerous than Canada. This is, uh, if you don't mind my saying, a depressing book, but it is well-reported and a very important read. America, The Farewell Tour. Chris Hedges, really good of you to come into TVO tonight. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.